What I wanted to talk about a little bit, what I, what I want to try and explain is how we came to the thinking that we came to when we were working on the energy efficiency proposals that we hope will be part of the energy union uh, package. You know, of course, that a key starting point is that we have decoupled, we aimed at decoupling GDP and energy consumption. Europe has decoupled GDP and energy consumption. And um, we're very nearly at the level that's needed to achieve the 2020 objective already in 2014. We expect that consumption will be a little bit higher in 15 than 14, because 14 was an exceptionally warm year, but still that the line will be very much. We, we expect to get to the 20% objective without much difficulty, despite the fact that national targets, which are the little dotted line here, National targets are not expecting to get there, but I mean, we, in a world of indicative rather than binding targets, I can see the wisdom for member states of being cautious and under-promising and over-achieving. What caused it? Well, we've been doing some decomposition analysis too. It seems to be the, uh, the tool at the moment. Um, broadly speaking, we're getting there despite increases in activity rates. So despite what Joanne referred to, the fact that we have bigger, we live in bigger houses, despite the fact that we've got a bigger population, despite the fact that we have more appliances, despite the fact that we're broadly travelling further, still we are reducing energy consumption, and the main driver is, quote, energy savings. That's not, not true in all sectors. In industry, it's true that you see a half of the energy savings in industry are because... Um, are because industry is making less, and only half are because it's making, it's using less efficient, less energy to produce each unit. These are data for 2005 to 2014. But still, if you look at buildings, by contrast, then you see very strongly the forces of increased activity are offset by energy savings. And if you look at, uh, while it's true that in the industrial sector and in freight transport, uh, economic problems are one of the causes of lower energy consumption. In the building sector, if anything, the opposite is true. You can see that levels of activity in the building sector are about a third below the 2008 peak. And given that when we uh, build new buildings, they're usually pretty good these days, and when we renovate, we usually make buildings better, the fact that we're not uh, investing as much as Adrian would like in um, in building uh, in the building sector is one of the is something is a way in which the recession is holding back efficiency rather than that it is causing reductions in energy use in our analysis so if it's not primarily the economic crisis which caused the rather good surface performance in energy consumption what is it um, we don't think that I mean, there are changes in behaviour. There is a greater awareness. Our kids are probably more aware than we were at, that, at their age. Um, in transport, you do see a postponement of people getting their own car because they want to go on public transport and use their smartphones. I mean, there are some changes, but fundamentally, I don't think it's behavioural change which has led to... I mean, you compare something like smoking. Why are people smoking less? Because they have changed their behaviour. That's the driver. It isn't the driver for the change in energy consumption that we're seeing. Not yet, anyway. Is it because we are upgrading more often? Is it because uh, um, we are replacing our assets with more efficient assets, choosing to go to the shop choosing to renovate, choosing to get a new car more frequently than we did before. Again, there's no evidence for that. I mean, on the building side, it's, if anything, the opposite. And more broadly, the work we do on eco-design, for example, doesn't reveal accelerating rates of product replacement. And, in fact, pretty often people hold on to products longer than the advertised lifetimes. I mean, we talk about boilers having a lifetime of 15 years, but most people I know their heater is 20 or 25 years old before they, before they get around to changing it. So it's not because the, the good progress we're seeing is not in our analysis because we've achieved things we want to achieve, scrappage, or faster rates of building renovation. What 
seems to be happening relatively clearly is that when and this fits I said it's boring but this is what Tyler said and I'm just saying it again is that when people buy a new television it's better than the one that they put that they got rid of but it's also more energy efficiency when you ask somebody to come and uh, improve your bathroom they say what about a bit of insulation at the same time when people buy new cars typically these days they're more efficient than the ones before so the only driver that we can see that can be causing the changes that we're seeing is one which is fundamentally around primarily products, including transport products, but also, to a degree, uh, building renovations, having become more energy efficient. And you've seen the data of, on, on these things before, that fridges, 98%, are now in the top classes. Uh, new dwellings con consume 40% less energy. Uh, the average consumption of new cars is a third less than it was in 1995. These are the reasons that the EU is consuming less energy than it was in 2006, 2007. We think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a story. I say we think, you know, I'm, I'm presenting it. I mean, I've only been talking five minutes and I've got to the end, nearly, of the, of the story of looking back. But it actually, because... The modelling doesn't actually have these numbers in it. When you see the modelling for it's got higher energy consumption in 2015 than we actually will have, and lines which struggle to get to 18 or 19% in 2020, it was only when we went back to the data and then started doing decomposition analysis that we were able to... We started realising, actually, the story is better than we thought it was. And the whole policy community a little bit was like that when the so-called JRC report came out um, last summer. In fact, it was a... A, a report of Eurostat data that are around. It wasn't some kind of brilliant piece of scientific analysis, but what the JRC did, which was very good, was draw to our attention the fact that we're doing pretty well. Now, if we think about a discussion that is going on, as you know, we have been asked to look at two targets, 27 and 30%. I will reassure you that our modelling also looks at 33 35 and 40%. If the Commission chooses for a 27% objective in 2030, then, as you can see, we let's assume we achieve dead on the 20% objective for 2020. Uh, then we will have saved 173. We will have reduced our energy consumption by 173 MTOs over that 10-year period. If we go for 27%, we'll only have to get, in the next decade, another 114. If we go for 30%, the two figures are roughly the same. So putting it another way, going for 30%, if the choice were to be to go for 30% in 2030, we'd be choosing to do about the same amount of work in the next decade as we're doing in this decade. Plus ou moins. And we've just seen that we're doing pretty well at achieving this decade's objective. So why do we actually need any policy or any more policy to get to next decade's objective? Um, this, this is new. You haven't seen this one before. So, um, <laughs> um, And the answer is, although I hate the expression low-hanging fruit, but we are beginning to get to the end of some of the easiest bits of product policy. When we move from incandescent lighting to CFLs, we reduce energy consumption by 80% in lighting. Now, we're not there yet. There's some halogen still to be squeezed out of the system, but we're well on the way. That means that only 20% is left. Half of, half of that, again, 45%, will go if we move from CFLs to LEDs, which is the next transition, the transition, if you like, for the next decade. But that's only going to save an eighth as much in absolute energy terms, as a transition from incandescence to CFLs. So policies, really important policies of that kind, are beginning to come to the end of what they can achieve. The white goods, the fridges, are another great example. That's not to say that we don't need product policy. We do. And I'm very glad, to, as you know, that the Commission will go ahead as part of the package with a new eco-design working plan that will include the commitment to keep working on the reviews of the existing product groups. There's plenty still to save there, but it cannot be. If we were to rely as strongly on product policy next decade, 
as we did this decade, we wouldn't be able to get to 27, let alone 30 percent. So the analysis we then went through is, where are we going to need to go? And I mean, there isn't really any debate. It, we need to do more about renovating buildings. Um, there are other solutions, and I was interested in what Eve was saying about transport. I think uh, uh, the key tool in transport is, in fact, urban planning and regional planning. And you can move directly on demand in that way. And even if Europe can't do much about that, we as a, as, a, as a society can do a lot. And we haven't explored the potential of that kind of policy sufficiently in our efficiency work, in my view. But still, um, if you look across the sectors, it seems to us that if we get, if we set an objective for 30%, for example, or 27, in 2030, and if we achieve that objective, or higher, if the parliament um, building renovation will have played a bigger role in that policy, in that success, than it has played in this decade. And that's both ensuring deepness, depth of building renovation, but also accelerating the rate of building renovation. First conclusion. Second conclusion, um, um, it's true that in buildings there are plenty of things with infinitesimally short payback times that can be done. Um, but even if you have uh, a product replacement and a building renovation which have the same payback time, the product replacement might cost 500 euros and the building renovation 10 or 20,000. So even if you don't have issues around payback times, you still have a need to put the money in the hands of the people who own the buildings which doesn't arise so strongly in a product policy driven process. So finding ways to get the money into the hands of the people uh, is more important, is going to be more important next decade than it is this decade. And that's reinforced by the fact that things with eight year payback times rather than two or three, still exceptionally good investments compared to keeping your money in the bank, but they're not as attractive, they're not such no-brainers from the point of view of building owners as some of the uh, product uh, replacements. I mean, light bulbs, you're talking about eight months. And therefore, getting the sophistication of the financial sector engaging with people is going to be more important as we get a bigger role for building renovation. Those two things are bad news, if you like, in the sense that policy gets harder, I'm nearly at the end, but the, the good news is that technology offers lots of potential to help us address those problems. And, I mean, there are lots of ways in which that's true, but one of the key ways is building automation and building controls. And that will do, in our view, uh, three things. The first one is it'll allow the behavioural channel the change in operational energy consumption of buildings to get moving alongside the trends that we've been seeing, which are really about physical trend, tr tr trends in insulation or in heating systems. So it will allow uh, this building to turn off the lights when we leave the room, dot, 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 much more sophisticated things than that. Um, second change, it will allow, through the accumulation of a big pile of data from Internet of Things, from lighting systems that are aware of whether or not people are in rooms and whether or not people voluntarily want the lights on when they're in rooms, we will have um, an ability, I mean, to give you an example, let's say the standard is set on the assumption that there are three people who live in a house. Let's say the sensors tell you there's sometimes, sometimes two, and this is the energy consumption, sometimes four, and this is the energy consumption. You can reliably calculate what the consumption would be with three. It's a bit more complicated when you take into account many variables rather than just one. But if you have lots of data and some de decent econometricians, you can do it. And that means that why it's actually possible for the person who knocks on your door and says, I want to put insulation in your roof and we'll share the profits, for you and that company to make a contract around what has happened to energy consumption before and afterwards, which strips out changes in behaviour, 
which turns operational data into asset data, if you like. And that will be a tool. I mean, we've talked before about the reason why we don't have an ESCO culture here, and that's to do, you said, with the fact that we don't, I think you're right, we don't have policies that say every industry has to save X or every big public sector body has to save X. And we're more reliant on micro in our policies. This technology will allow us to get the micro working, I think. And thirdly, I mean, I won't go on about it, but it also allows us to get into demand response as a, uh, so uh, smart technologies will allow your freezer to go down to minus 18 when the wind is blowing and go up, provided it doesn't go above minus 7 when the wind is not blowing, and you to get paid for that. So technology will allow these three things to happen, which will help us both, both uh, finance building renovations and also get savings in renovated buildings, not only from the physical changes, but also from the behavioural changes that those things allow. Oops. So please, my new slide. And there we are. Thank you very much.